All right, let's jump right into this. Something happened on December 3rd. It was an event that quietly, almost secretly, changed the fundamental laws of physics for the entire crypto economy. And the crazy part? Almost nobody even noticed. So today, we're going to unpack a thesis that claims this was the single most important day for Ethereum since the merge. We're going to find out what happened, why it's such a huge deal, and how it all connects to a secret furnace now burning away at the very heart of the crypto world. So here's the game plan. First, we're going to pull back the curtain on this unseen upgrade in a really weird paradox that's hidden deep inside its code. Then we'll follow the data trail, the on-chain evidence to see this new Ethereum furnace in action. After that, we'll connect the dots to a company that's sitting on what you could call a digital treasure chest. And finally, we'll see how all this sets up what's being called a mechanical super cycle and an information gap that might just be the most important piece of this whole story. So what exactly went down on December 3rd? Well, the event itself was a technical upgrade with the code name Fasaka. Now, on the surface, it looked, well, kind of boring. Just another update for the tech guys. But the analysis we're digging into argues that its real impact was massively misunderstood. This wasn't just some software patch. It was like they installed a brand new, high-powered engine right into the core of Ethereum. And this quote, man, it just says it all, doesn't it? While the developers were busy getting the last node synced up and Fasaka officially went live, the rest of the financial world was totally looking the other way. But on chain, in the raw data itself, something fundamental was shifting about how the network works and more importantly, how its currency, ETH, gets its value. This slide really gets to the core of the confusion. The common thinking was, oh, Fasaka, that's just a dull tech tweak. It introduced a system called Peer DAS, which basically adds more lanes to Ethereum's data highway. This was meant for layer two networks. You can think of those as express lanes built on top of Ethereum's main road, like Arbitrum or Base. The whole point was to make it cheaper for them to run. But the reality, according to this thesis, is way, way more dramatic. It's not an efficiency upgrade. It's a furnace, a combustion engine designed to burn ETH like never before. And this leads us to a fascinating, kind of mind-bending economic paradox that's at the heart of this whole thing. You'd think, pretty intuitively, that if you make something cheaper, you'll make less money from it overall. But that is not what happened here. And understanding why that's the case is the key to seeing the fatal flaw in the old, bearish argument against this upgrade. So yeah, the market's logic, it seemed totally straightforward, right? A piece of every Ethereum fee gets burned, permanently deleted from existence. So if the Fasaka upgrade makes fees lower, then that has to mean less ETH gets burned. That was the whole bearish case in a nutshell. But, and this is a huge but, that thinking completely missed a core economic principle that's been proven right for centuries. And that principle? It's called the Jevons Paradox. It's a bit counterintuitive, but it is incredibly powerful. The classic example is the steam engine. When you invent a more efficient engine that uses less coal, you don't end up burning less coal as a society. You end up burning way more coal. Because now steam power is so cheap you can use it for everything. Trains, factories, you name it. The explosion in demand completely swamps the efficiency gains. And this thesis argues the exact same thing is happening right now with Ethereum's block space. So let's break down how this actually plays out on Ethereum. Step 1. Fusaka makes the fuel, that data space on Ethereum, drastically cheaper for all those layer 2s. Step 2. This super cheap fuel unleashes a massive wave of new demand. All of a sudden, applications that were just too expensive before are now possible. Fully on-chain games, decentralized social media, high-frequency trading. And then, step three, while each individual transaction might have a smaller fee, the sheer, colossal volume of transactions gets so big that the total amount of ETH being burned just explodes. The furnace is running hotter because the fuel got cheaper. Wild, right? All right, so that's the theory. It's a cool economic argument, for sure. But is it real? Is this actually happening? Well, let's turn to the on-chain data, because the proof of this furnace firing up is immediate, and according to this analysis, it's undeniable. And whoa, the on-chain data is, it's pretty startling. Just look at the ETH burn rate. Before the upgrade, it was chugging along at a steady pace. Immediately after December 3rd, it effectively doubled. In fact, the source material says that in the first 24 hours after the upgrade, more ETH was burned than in the entire week before it. This wasn't some gradual ramp up. It was like someone just flipped a giant switch. And to really get how big a deal this is, you have to look at the history. For about six months before this upgrade, Ethereum was actually slightly inflationary. More ETH was being created from staking than was being destroyed through the burn. 
December 3rd, that's the day. That's the moment it all flipped on its head. The network's entire monetary policy changed overnight, from inflationary to definitively deflationary. And this brings us back to that term you hear thrown around a lot in crypto circles, ultrasound money. The idea is pretty simple. An asset whose total supply is actively going down is a superior form of money. With this Fusaka furnace now burning hotter than the rate of new ETH being created, Ethereum, according to this view, has firmly stepped back into that territory. Okay, so big picture. Ethereum's supply is now shrinking, mechanically. This is a massive deal for the whole ecosystem, a change in its DNA. But what if, what if there was one company, a publicly traded company, that was just perfectly set up to benefit from this? Well, that brings us to Bitmine Immersion Technologies, ticker BMNR. And this right here, this is the number. This is the one you need to remember from this whole thing. 3.73 million ETH. That's what Bitmine Immersion Technologies, or BMNR, holds. It's their core asset, and it's a fixed amount. Now, just think about that for a second. What happens when you own a fixed chunk of a company that is constantly buying back its own stock and just setting it on fire? The analysis uses this really great analogy of a rising ocean. Imagine you own a piece of land, safe up on a hill in a big city. Every single day, the ocean rises and swallows up an acre of property down by the coast. The city itself is literally shrinking. Now, your piece of land on the hill hasn't changed at all, but it now represents a much larger, more valuable percentage of all the land that's left. In this story, BMR's ETH is that land on the hill, and that rising ocean? That's the Fusaka furnace, burning away the total supply, day in and day out. And this is what the thesis calls the hidden dividend of deflation. It's not a dividend you get in the mail, it's a dividend paid in dominance. As the total supply of ETH shrinks, BMNR's fixed stash of it automatically becomes a bigger piece of the entire network. As you can see here, if the supply shrinks by 10%, their share of the network just grows from 3.0% to 3.3%. It happens passively, without them having to lift a finger. But that passive gain? That's only half the story. To get the full picture, you have to look at the other side of the market. Demand. And this is where we get into this really powerful idea of a mechanical supercycle. A supercycle, the argument goes, happens when you have two massive, unstoppable forces colliding with each other. On one side, you have a supply that is mechanically shrinking. This isn't based on feelings or market sentiment. The code is just burning ETH, period. On the other side, you have a brand new wave of institutional demand. And this isn't speculative demand. This is what's called inelastic demand. Companies like BlackRock and Fidelity building services on Ethereum need ETH to operate, no matter the price. It's like a factory needing electricity to run. That kind of sticky must-have demand hitting a shrinking supply. Well, that's the textbook definition of a squeeze. Now, here's where it gets really, really interesting. The thesis calls this a financial anomaly. See, usually in investing, you have to pick. You can go for a growth asset that you hope appreciates, or you can go for a yield asset that pays you cash flow. But the argument here is that with BMNR, you get both. First, the value of their main asset, that huge pile of 3.73 million ETH, goes up as it gets scarcer. But second, the cash flow from that asset also goes up. All this new network activity means more fees for validators, and BMNR captures that increased yield through their staking operations. So the asset's value goes up, and the cash it generates also goes up. It's a rare double win, plain and simple. So you might be asking yourself, if this is all so huge, if the economics have fundamentally shifted, why isn't it on the front page of every financial newspaper? And that brings us to the final and maybe most important piece of the puzzle, an opportunity that exists because of a gap, a big one, an information and understanding between two very different worlds. This slide just lays it all out. You have this information asymmetry. An on-chain analyst can pull up a block explorer right now and see in real time that the burn rate has doubled. The data is live, it's transparent, it's right there. But a traditional Wall Street analyst, they operate in a different universe. They're trained to wait for lagging indicators, quarterly reports, official press releases, big news headlines. They're basically operating with an information delay of weeks, maybe even months. One world is watching a live feed, the other is waiting for last week's newspaper to arrive. And this is the absolute core of the investment thesis we're looking at today. The argument is simple. The price of the underlying asset, ETH, is starting to wake up to this new deflationary reality. But the stock price of the public company holding a massive fixed amount of it, BMNR, is still lagging way behind. 
The market for the stock just hasn't caught up yet. It hasn't priced in this fundamental change. And that delay, that right there, is the opportunity gap. So when you put it all together, what you have is this incredible monetary experiment playing out in real time. A global decentralized currency that is mechanically programmed to destroy itself at a faster and faster rate the more it gets used. The on-chain data shows the furnace is lit. The institutional demand is starting to show up. So the only real question left is, what happens when this slow-moving on-chain supply shock finally crosses over into the mainstream and becomes front-page news? Now, all of this data is public, so you can go check out the burn rates for yourself. It's a really fascinating convergence of technology, economics, and market psychology. The furnace is definitely lit, and we'll be watching to see how it all unfolds. Don't forget to subscribe, and thanks for watching.